Good morning. Today I'm going to be talking about nutritional epigenetics and some of the implications that this has for diabetes. So just a quick overview of what we're going to cover today. It's actually a big topic to cover in a very short time frame. Um, so we'll just kind of hit on highlights. But first, I'm going to do a very quick review of genetics and gene expression, just to make sure that's kind of at the forefront of our minds. Then we'll look at some definitions of epigenetics, as well as some of the epigenetic modifications that occur and what drives those epigenetic modifications. We'll look a little bit about some of the impacts of food and other environmental factors on epigenetics. And then we'll use glucose transporter 4, or GLUT4, as, as one example. And then briefly throughout the presentation, I want to have a little bit of discussion in terms of what this means for patient care, if anything, at this point. So just a quick review, um, things that you're all familiar with in terms of genetics. So our DNA is our basic um, genetic code. So it tells our body um, what kind of proteins to make, when to make them, those, well not when to make them, but what kinds of proteins to make. So the structure of DNA is this classic alpha helix that we're familiar with. So basically the, the um, DNA alphabet is a four letter alphabet, A, T, C, and G. So those nucleotides pair up and then combine with some other compounds and form this nice alpha helix that we're really familiar with. Something that I think we sometimes forget with our genetic material is it isn't just this alpha helix. These, this DNA is wrapped around a histone core. So histones are the proteins that the DNA wraps around. <clears throat> and as we talk about epigenetics, that becomes really important because there's changes that happen to the histones as well. So this more globular figure represents those histones. So the different colors are different types of histones that that DNA wraps around. And then you see the nice uh, gray DNA wrapping around that histone core. Then, of course, the DNA showed here again is that very simplistic alpha helix, but in reality it would be wrapped around the histones, is condensed into chromosomes, and those are found in the nuclei of our cells. When we talk about gene expression, essentially what we are talking about is making proteins. So every protein in our body, which there are tons of them with multiple, many, many functions, so things like antibodies and um, hormones and all sorts of things that proteins do, every protein needs to have a gene that codes for it. So remember the genes are just a small segment of DNA. So when we talk about gene expression, basically that DNA code needs to go through several steps to make the protein. And those steps are transcription and translation, essentially, with some other mid-level steps in there. But that, those are kind of the basic steps to remember. So we start with the DNA, we have transcription, copying that over to RNA, and then translation is what takes that mRNA and turns that into a protein, gathers up the amino acids. So this is important because as we talk about epigenetics, what we're really talking about is a lot of controls over gene expression. Because when we think about it, every cell in our body that has a nucleus has the full genetic code. Well, we don't want every gene expressed in every cell all the time. So for example, when we think about diabetes, insulin is a hormone, it's a protein. We don't want insulin produced all the time. We want it sometimes on, sometimes off. So that's, <clears throat> that's important um, that we kind of think about how, how the genes get turned on and off. So then we kind of think about, okay, well, what makes that happen? How do they get turned on and off? How does, how does a gene know when to express, when to make the protein, when not to make the protein? Well, there's a lot of factors that in, are involved, but epigenetics is one of the big factors. So what is epigenetics? Well, essentially, epigenetics is are is chemical compounds that are attached to either the DNA itself or those histone cores that the DNA is wrapped around, or it can be an impact on other parts like, um, we'll talk a little bit about microRNAs or non-coding RNAs. But so the, the major things that we're most familiar with are the chemical compounds that attach to the DNA or the histones that that DNA is wrapped around. And essentially, when those chemical compounds attach to the DNA, it doesn't change the structure, so it doesn't change our genetic code, but it changes how that code is expressed. So it may make a gene be able to express more, so make more protein, upregulate, or express less, make less protein, downregulate. So epigenetics is becoming a widely studied area in looking at how can we control some of this gene expression for the better, for more positive health outcomes. 
So that's sort of a very informal uh, definition of epigenetics. Chemical compounds that attach to our genetic material, so DNA, histones, um, and other materials that are involved in our genetic code, they don't change the sequence, they just change how the genes act. Well, here's some more formal definitions. So on the left, there's a classic definition. And I'll talk about sort of the importances in the differences here. So this classic definition says the study of mitotically and or meiotically heritable changes in gene function that cannot be explained by changes in DNA sequence. So one key element of this definition is that mitotically and or meiotically heritable changes. Because what that's saying, and this classic definition is one that's often used, that's basically saying in order for it to be called epigenetics, it has to be transmitted from cell division to cell division, and that often means also even in reproduction. So it's a multi-generational uh, change in the chemical compounds attached to the genetic material. This more inclusive definition on the right, I think these types of definitions are coming around because we're learning how vast uh, the epigenome is and how many different modifications happen, chemical compounds attaching to our genetic material. So this one says the structural adaptation of chromosomal regions. So basically saying it doesn't change the sequence, but it changes kind of the layout, how, how that DNA is situated in the nucleus so as to register, signal, or perpetuate altered activity states. So when we talk about altered activity states, we're really talking about whether the gene is expressing or not expressing, or if it's expressing a lot or expressing a little. So the commonalities in these definitions is that it's changes that don't actually change the DNA sequence or the actual um, genetic material, but rather it changes the chemical compounds that are attached that affect how that gene is expressed. The differences in these definitions are whether it's required that, the, there's, that these uh, chemical compounds sort of stick through multiple cell divisions or whether maybe it can be a shorter term action. I think that's important and I tend to lean towards this more inclusive definition because I think in terms of thinking about, um, you know, for example, clinically, how you're working, working with patients with diabetes, we're often looking at things that are lifestyle changes, perhaps medication changes, other types of things that we're hoping will change how their genes work in a shorter time frame than multi-generational. So we're hoping it will impact them in their lifetime and, and hopefully, you know, a, a shorter, as short as possible. You know, we want the most change in the shortest time possible. So I think looking at this more inclusive definition lets us think, okay, what kind of changes can we perhaps um, stimulate in, on a more short-term basis? So these are some of the definitions. There's not one um, absolute definition of epigenetics out there. So what are these chemicals that attach to the genetic material to make the changes? Well, there are many of them, as you can see on the screen. There are some that are more well studied. So for example, DNA methylation is when methyl groups attach to the DNA itself. <clears throat> that is one of the first epigenetic areas that was really studied and there's a lot of research in that area. Some of the more recent research is looking at a lot of these other types of areas and particularly what happens not necessarily to the DNA itself, but to the histones and to the other um, pieces of the genetic material. How do the chemicals that attach to that affect how the gene is expressed? So we'll look at a couple of these. We'll look a little bit at DNA methylation and the histone modifications, since those are the, the more widely studied, uh, particularly in terms of possible nutritional epigenetics. So just briefly, DNA methylation, in this image, the, <clears throat> the solid arrow represents DNA, and the round ball on there is a transcription factor. So remember that first step when we looked at the gene expression slide? The first step from going from DNA to RNA, which then can create a protein, is transcription. So these things called transcription factors bind to the gene that allows that first step in the process to happen. So what you see here, the little methyl groups are the black balls with the little blue balls below them. On the first image, there's none of those, and the transcription factor binds really well, which basically allows the gene to be active and allows for an increased level of gene expression. In the second image, you see those methyl groups attached, which interferes with the ability of that transcription factor to bind, and so we have less gene expression. 
So in general, DNA methylation decreases, <clears throat> excuse me, transcription and um, gene expression, whereas low levels of methylation or hypomethylation increases gene expression. And on the bottom, you just see that also there's other chemical compounds that can attach to the methyl groups, so sort of another layer um, that also will reduce gene expression. So that's one big area, and we'll look a little bit again, um, some specifics nutritionally in terms of DNA methylation. Now, one thing to keep in mind with methylation is that methylation isn't across the board good or bad because it really depends what gene you're talking about. So for example, lots of epigenetic research is done in the field of cancer. So in cancer, we have oncogenes that cause cancer development and growth, or we have tumor suppressor genes that reduce that tumor growth. Well, obviously we would like to see those genes that code for the tumor suppressor proteins or tumor suppressors to um, increase, and we want the oncogenes to be kind of quiet. So we don't really have an across-the-board um, statement on whether methylation is good or bad, but this is some of what's kind of being uh, teased out in the research. So here we look a little bit more specifically at the histones. So the nucleosome is essentially the, that histone core with the DNA wrapped around it. So these ovals here are the histones and the black little ribbon type uh, structure is the DNA. So when we look at that nucleosome, the histone with the DNA wrapped around, you see that the histones have these little tails that come off. Well, those tails are great places for chemical compounds to attach and a variety of chemicals can attach there. Methyl groups, um, acetyl groups, phosphorus groups, so those all affect gene expression. So they affect essentially the structure, um, again, not the code of the DNA, but the structure of how it's situated. So for a gene to express, meaning for it to make protein, it has to be a little bit loose, open, because it has to be able to make a copy. Um, so these histone tails and how they kind of either tighten or loosen um, how that, you know, how the gene is situated, how the uh, genetic material as a whole is situated, that sort of dictates how easily that gene can be transcribed or not. So histone modifications are a big um, element of epigenetics that's, again, being quite widely studied. So our next question is, we're talking about nutritional epigenetics, so what does food have to do with all of this? <clears throat> I think one of the best visual descriptions I've heard on this, um, uh, Ruth DeBusk, who actually spoke at this conference a number of years ago, uh, uses this term, and she says that food washes over our genes every day. And I loved that because I think it really shows and helps us think about the power food has on our genes. So basically anything we take in, whether it's air, whether it's environmental pollutants that we breathe in, whether it's secondhand smoke that we breathe in, any of that goes in our body and sort of touches our genes, gets in our cells and touches our genes. Well, when we eat, our body breaks the, that food down into all the chemical components that it is, and that in turn then goes through chemical processes that, that those chemicals then go into our cells and touch our genes. So when we talk about nutritional epigenetics, we're talking about how the nutrition, the food we eat, and the bioactive components of that food can cause the, a change in these chemical compounds that are attached to our genetic material that then in turn changes gene expression. One classic example in epigenetics is the agouti mice. So the agouti gene, um, there's a dominant gene that's called agouti viable yellow. And the mouse on the left has the typical phenotype of the agouti viable yellow gene. Um, this, this yellow fur coat, but also the mouse is obese. And something you can't see is that the, the mice with, these dominant, with this dominant gene are uh, develop diabetes and some of the metabolic aberrations that we're familiar with with diabetes. Well, the, that version of the gene, that allele of the gene, essentially has a little extra piece in it. Well, what is known is that if that gene can be silenced, then even if the mouse has that gene, it doesn't express it. So these two mice are actually genetically identical twins. So they have the exact same genetic makeup, the genetic material, the exact same sequence of DNA. 
what was different in these two mice is that the mom, when mom was pregnant with the mouse on the left, she was fed a diet that was high in what we call methyl donors. Um, B vitamins, betaine or, were a big part of that. The mom, on, for, when she was pregnant with the mouse on the left, she didn't consume that type of diet. So what happened is the, the agouti viable yellow uh, gene that the mouse on the right also has was silenced because there was that hypermethylation, meaning lots of methyl groups attaching to that mouse's genome and causing that gene to be silenced. So this was is really fascinating and something you all may have heard about already in terms of epigenetics because it tells us the power of nutrition in terms of development. And this particular um, scenario and example is really related to maternal nutrition. Now you kind of think, all right, well then if we just feed the mouse on the left, a lot of methyl donors, can we reverse this? Well, no, unfortunately DNA methylation is very stable throughout a, a mouse or a person's life. And so once this mouse is born this way, that's the phenotype they're going to have. However, if we know there's some things we can help mom do differently, it, that's a good thing. Now, of course, this is mice. Um, but, but it is fascinating and it, is, it has triggered a lot of other research in terms of what we can do. This really fits with that classic definition of epigenetics, meaning that, that um, those chemicals that are attached to the DNA, so in this case DNA methylation, it really sustains through multiple cell divisions. Um, one thing again that I think is interesting that I I'm interested in looking at is what are some of the epigenetic modifications that can be affected in a more shorter term. So maybe in years, um, months would be fantastic. So what are some things we can do that help people have uh, improved gene expression of the genes that we want to express more of or want to express less of in a little bit of a shorter time frame? So that's DNA methylation. Um, one example of DNA methylation and, and nutritional epigenetics related to it. When we look at diet or nutrition and epigenetics in general, we can, this, this author separates um, uh, compounds, I guess, into nutrients and non-nutrients. So on the left, uh, nutrients, and, and it could be argued, you know, whether those are good terms, um, but nutrients, what we classically think of as our body absolutely needing to function. So carbohydrate, protein, fat, vitamins, minerals. And then on the right, what they call non-nutrients, so like polyphenols, so we're familiar with things like genistein from soy, curcumin, resveratrol from uh, grape skins, um, allele sulfides from garlic, those types of things that we know have health benefits, but maybe not totally essential. Although, again, maybe that's questionable. So when you look down to the bottom of this image, you can see basically, so on the left, for example, um, the nutrients and the macronutrients and the micronutrients, so particularly those B vitamins and then the short chain fatty acids that are a byproduct of fiber metabolism in our col colon. Um, so when you follow those pathways down to the very bottom, you can see basically these affect histone acetylation, DNA and histone methylation, um, and then on the far right, DNA and histone methylation and acetylation. So basically we're saying these foods we eat affect those chemical compounds that attach to our DNA or our genetic material, the histones as well, and affect gene expression. This next slide I have is really very much the same information, just in a little bit different format. So on the left, nutrients and food components that affect methylation, and on the right, those that affect histone modification. So again, we're looking at things like folate, vitamin B12, all those B vitamins, zinc, selenium, uh, genesin in soybeans, uh, tea, fiber, alcohol, butyrate, um, which is a short chain fatty acid that's, again, a byproduct of fiber breakdown. And then protein restriction actually um, may have some beneficial effects on methylation. Now, now that's not inadequate protein, it's just not overdoing on protein. Then on the right, some of the nutrients that affect histone modification, again, the B vitamins, and then some of those uh, polyphenols that we just talked about, resveratrol, butyrate, uh, sulforaphanes, which are in those cruciferous vegetables, so things like broccoli and cauliflower. Um, choline, curcumin, again, protein and calorie restriction, some benefits there, and then perhaps some uh, effects of high fat and high glycemic index uh, diets in histone modifications, and not necessarily in a positive way in that regard. 
So what does this tell us? What, what can we do about this or what, how can we use this in patients? Well, in reality, it may be things that you are already saying to patients, but to me, what this really emphasizes is that these are things found in real food. And sometimes with diabetes, I think we have a tendency to focus a lot on um, weight loss, carbohydrates, um, which are certainly important, but I think we don't want to emphasize that at the risk of an overall healthy diet that contributes all sorts of bioactives in our food. I think if we solely focus on that and forget about overall nutrition, we may be doing a disservice to patients because when you think about all of these things on the screen, these are all of those bioactives that are in real food. So I think the more we can encourage um, less processed foods, more wholesome foods, that's going to have these food compounds that are going to positively affect those chemical compounds that have attached to our genes and allow our genes to express in the best possible way. So one, to just kind of walk through a quick example um, with diabetes, we're gonna use glucose transporter four. This is something I've been working with um, for a bit, doing some research on glucose transporter four. And as you'll remember, that is an insulin sensitive glucose transporter. So um, when insulin attaches, the glucose transporter four, or GLUT4 is sort of upregulated, primarily active in muscle and fat tissue, but to some extent in other tissues as well, including cardiac tissue and actually some white blood cells as well. Uh, the gene, remember anytime we have a protein, so GLUT4 is a protein, anytime we have a protein, we have to have a gene that codes for it. And the GLUT4 gene is on chromosome 17, so this just kind of shows a little picture of where that is. And then this is the image I showed you before about the histones. So interestingly, um, we know that in muscle tissue, there's histone modifications that happen when GLUT4 is upregulated, so when there's more activity of GLUT4. So you'll see here in this particular picture is not specific to GLUT4, but basically saying there's some of those chemical compounds that are attaching to the histones. So not so much like the DNA methylation, but, but the chemical compounds that attach to histones, which are probably a little bit more, um, a little bit more pliable, I guess, if you will. So we can change that more probably during a person's life. The other interesting thing is that exercise stimulates some of these epigenetic changes on um, the histones of the GLUT4 gene, which then perhaps cause a change in GLUT4 expression. So again, my guess is all of you encourage your patients to exercise, but I think what this does is it really helps us see how deep these lifestyle changes go. It's not just about exercising for the weight loss, and I think some patients hear that even if that's not what's said. So it's exercising for the overall effect it has at a molecular level in our body and how that really can change things, perhaps for long term, if that exercise is consistent and sustainable. So when do these changes have to happen? How long do we have to make the changes? Well, this is really an area that I think is being studied a lot more. Most of the research has been done in neonatal and very early um, after birth. So those really critical periods where there's rapid cell division and development and epigenetic resetting and those sorts of things. So that's there's a lot of research on that. But there is also research looking at a little bit more shorter term. So how can we change things again in months or years in a person's life? It does seem that there's probably parts of the genome that are more easily changed and other parts that are less easily changed in terms of the epigenetic modifications. Um, so it just needs to be researched. But I think there is evidence to show that some of the changes when we make sustainable lifestyle changes, for example, in diet and exercise, those can have long lasting effects. So what does it mean for patient care? Um, this is kind of challenging because a lot of this is in the early research stages and it's not like we can say, oh, eat this and it'll you know, change your epigenetics in this way. It, it doesn't work that way. Um, and really the bottom line is this may not change what you tell patients, but it may change the way you tell it or the importance you place on it. So I would say the key messages really are encourage those whole foods, a wholesome diet, natural foods, foods that still have those bioactive compounds that are going to positively impact epigenetics. Don't just focus on calories and carbohydrates and weight. Although that's important, I, I don't disagree with that. I think we need to think about the whole diet, the whole lifestyle, and how that affects health overall. 
continue to recommend exercise and think about it again, not only for the weight loss and the immediate effects, but perhaps how it changes that entire um, sort of metabolic environment in the patient. And then really help patients with making changes that truly are lifestyle changes and long-term, because probably to have a, a longer-term impact on the epigenetic markers that can change gene expression for the long-term, it's going to be those sustained changes over a long period of time that have the most impact.